Hey everybody and welcome back to another edition of the Physio Trios podcast. Today we have with us Claire Robertson. Claire, welcome. Uh, you. Now, uh, I assume you guys are probably going to recognise Claire. She's been on the podcast before, back way at the beginning. So it's nice to, to have her back on. Now, today we're going to be talking about uh, patella femoral pain syndrome, then with a little few caveats as we go. Uh, but Claire, before we jump in, why don't you take two minutes just to reintroduce yourself to the audience and then we'll just dive straight on in. Sure, yeah, so I'm a physiotherapist. I'm still working as a consultant physiotherapist. I'm also a researcher and uh, an educator and all three of those clinical research and education are around uh, patellofemoral pain. So my whole clinical practice is patellofemoral pain. And in fact, I recently worked out I don't know if I should say this or not, that I'd gone past the 10,000 mark with patellofemoral uh, patients. Wow. <laughs> so it's a fair few. <laughs> just, just a couple, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Okay. When, when you put it into numbers like that, that's what some physios would see over the course of a, a decade, maybe, <laughs> or you know, their whole, yeah. whole span of... Yeah. Jeez. Um, but with, with that said, um, what is patellofemoral pain then what what is it we're talking about today can yeah, you break that well, down for us it's an umbrella term and that's a dilemma in many ways because you could get anything from a patient who's an obese 13 year old who's not participating in any sport barely to a 45 year old ultra marathon runner both with patellofemoral pain and yet um, the drivers the risk factors and the drivers for those two patients are really different but any pain that originates um, from the patellofemoral joint or the uh, parapatella soft tissues that's generally anteriorly located but not always. So it can be medially laterally or even in the popliteal fossa, but aggravated by activities such as stairs, getting out of a chair, walking downhill. They, uh, and if necessary, if you eliminate other pathologies like meniscal pathology, then the chances are you're left with patellofemoral pain. Okay, now, one of the things that you said there right at the beginning is it's a bit of an umbrella mm. term, and that's kind of the issue that I see sometimes when um, I see patients as a second referral or something, and it's someone who couldn't quite figure out what was going on and just threw that label on it and said, right, take this and go away, and we're going to do some basic exercises, and they give almost a cookie-cutter approach yeah. as to what they're going to do because, hey, patella from oral pain, you know, this is one thing, one thing should fix it. Um, obviously, that's a bit of a problem. Now, can you sort of break down where those differences are within patella from oral pain and what kinds of things we should look out for to distinguish it from one sort of pain that requires one approach and one sort of symptom or issue that requires another approach? Mm, I think I see the same again. You know, lots of patients who have these reams of exercise, they pull out a list like a scroll from their bag. And I, you know, and I, if we want to be evidence-based about it, the evidence around adherence to exercise shows very clearly if you go above three exercises, adherence really drops off. So, you know, it doesn't make sense to, and you don't get buy-in if you're giving a bit of a catch-all, as I would call it. So we do need to try and break it down. So, we need to be uh, bespoke with our assessment. So I wouldn't assess everybody in the same way. And this is what I talk about on the course, is giving strategies for different assessment tools, which might make you go down more down the muscle strength route, the muscle length route, or the movement control route, to try and ascertain you know, what, are, what are the key risk factors here. And I talk about a shopping basket of risk factors. So there might be some risk factors in the shopping basket that you can't um, change, like global hypermobility. But then it's like, OK, well, what else is coming into this basket in combination with that? So say we've got someone that's hypermobile, their new risk factor might be that they've started a new job where they're standing all day and they're standing um, and perhaps as the day goes on, they're dropping to femoral internal rotation. So that is the risk factor that's come into that equation. So we should be able to get them back to the point where yes, the hypermobility is still there, but they have no patellofemoral pain anymore because we've managed their endurance, their ability to cope with the standing. We're not going to just remove the standing and say, don't work. No. So we're going to say, OK, let's give you the tools to be able to cope with that extra element that's come into your shopping basket. So viewing it like that, what are the risk factors for this person? And that will vary hugely from person to person. So 
what sort of risk factors or what sort of indications could we have as physiotherapists to push us more towards that patellofemoral pain issue and away from something else happening around the knee? So while well, we're looking for um, insidious onset, um, so absence of trauma, um, we're looking for absence of, of an effusion. Now, an effusion can cause a patellofemoral pain problem, but I would always reel back and say, why is that effusion there? Because that is not right for a healthy knee to have an effusion, and mechanical patellofemoral pain shouldn't cause an effusion either. So looking for the presence of an effusion. Um, and patellofemoral pain, there are distinct patterns of things that will provoke pain and the, the biggest thing is loading inflection, getting out of a chair, going up and down the stairs. They are the, the, the classics and that's for a reason because there's more patellofemoral loading in deeper flexion. So if the person actually has more problems with rotational movements or standing and walking, then we might actually be saying, well, actually, is this a meniscal pathology or is this a fat pad problem, say, instead? Okay. So once we've then broken things down a little bit more and we've figured out that we're dealing with something more of a patellofemoral nature, what are we going to be doing in our assessment? Like you said, you're going to tailor your assessment to each person. Mm. What's the approach? So I use the subjective to plot out the objective. So depending on what they're saying, so for example, if they say that cinema signs, sitting with a knee bent at 90 degrees is their prime problem, then that pushes more towards looking at muscle length than say, for example, foot biomechanics or strength or endurance. Whereas if we say, have someone that says the end of a shift standing or the end of a run, they have their problem creeps in, then that's suggestive that fatigue is creating a change so then I'm really interested in looking at their endurance capabilities and how we're going to assess those. Or it might be a tennis player that says on one surface they're okay, but another surface where the bounce is lower, that's the problem. So I'm thinking, okay, so I need to look at their movement into that deeper flexion on what's happening with that. So listening to them is so important to then directing what is pertinent to look at. So of course there are common areas that I will frequently look at with respect to muscle length, muscle strength, movement quality, proprioception, sport specific tasks, but I'll make that very individual from one patient to another. Okay, now what is it, if you can break down a little bit, what's the rationale behind the uh, muscle length being the issue if it's someone sitting for a long time? Yeah, so when we're sat, and this is important, that sat with only at 90, um, then through the quads attachment, they're getting a compressive vector, compressing the patellofemoral joint. So, and I, in that instant, would actually then say to them, what happens when you cross your legs? And some of them distinctly say, that's even worse. So, of course, then that's going to implicate the lateral structures. And although we can't stretch the ITB itself, we can stretch its proximal contractile origins. So it's all about a compressive problem with cinema sign. Okay, fantastic. Nice. So you've broken it down. You've figured out which aspects we're looking at, whether it's a muscle endurance issue, whether it's a muscle length issue, what have you. How are you then going to tailor your program to that individual? What are you looking at? As, like you say, there's also the um, physical activities or their participation activities, so their sport or what have mm. you. How are you then breaking it down to help them get back to where they need to be? Sure. So really it's about saying, okay, if I don't want to go above three exercises, which unless I have a highly motivated person, and then I might, but generally I'm trying not to go above three exercises. So what can I give them that is pertinent to my assessment findings? Is doable given the context they're gonna be working in, so home, for example, or gym setting. They understand they can clearly go and replicate at home. Um, given those factors, you know, then I'm gonna be giving, yeah, maybe <clears throat> a couple of stretches, or a couple of strength things. And I'm not a fan of chopping and changing exercise programs hugely. So even take, say, for example, their strength work, I might take the same um, exercise. So for example, um, 
you know, the humble squat. I might start with a wall squat, double legged, at 30 degrees, no weight, isometrically. I then might move them to 70% weight bearing on one leg, the other leg on toes at 30 degrees. I then might add in some therabands, so they've got to use their glutes a bit harder synergistically at that angle. <clears throat> I might then add in some free weights at that angle. Then I might move them away from the wall and go back to double legged, uh, no weights, and then layer up again with the band, the weights. But I think if you're constantly chopping and changing exercises completely, it's frustrating for patients and I think it's harder for them to keep their routine. Whereas we can just use our physio expertise and say, I need to, if I'm strengthening, I need to load them to fatigue. That is key. Otherwise we're faffing around the edges. We need to take them to fatigue two to three times a week. The exercise physiology is clear about that. So what can I do that's as straightforward as possible, that takes them to that point, and then how can I just tweak it over time so that they can still do that set routine that's really working for them. And even sometimes the little trick of if an exercise is starting to get a bit easy, moving it to the end of the program when they're already fatigued from their other exercises, sometimes that's enough just to keep that exercise working a bit longer for them. To get that stimulus, <clears> yeah. <throat> and I think that's really important what you highlight there, that element of taking it to fatigue. Now, obviously you gave a wall sit at 30 degrees and then a wall sit at 70 degrees. Now, for anyone listening to that, that might sound initially really you know, quite light. And that's one of the things that we get often as physios that we often don't push our patients enough. But that caveat of for that person, what's going to bring them to fatigue? Yeah. So obviously there's going to be people who, let's say if you have Andreas or Kai, they're obviously quite sporty, quite you know, strong fellas throughout the chain. Yeah. You're not with someone like that going to be working at your 70 or 30 degrees. You're going to get them to something that's going to bring them to that fatigue. One of the other things that you mentioned there as well was the use of a TheraBand, for example, of bringing in more gluteal activation. Mm. Now, that, I assume, factors in from something you've seen during your assessment. Uh, so I'm going to ask maybe a bit of a provocative question. <laughs> But where do you see the influence of the movement of the kinetic chain? So everything throughout, because we focused at the knee. Obviously, we're talking about patellofemoral pain syndrome, but you've mentioned the glutes as well. Now, I think myself, we'd be remiss if we don't mention the fact that although we're looking at the knee, above and below the chain is always important. Absolutely. And that whole <clears throat> chain is super important. Absolutely. So we're looking, moving away from the concept of maltracking, where you just concentrating on the patella to the concept of malalignment. You know, it sounds really pedantic, but it's so important because it's therefore thinking about, am I thinking about patella position or trochlear position or both? Because when we think about trochlear position, it's okay, well, what influence is that? The pelvis, the trunk, the femur, the foot, they all start to influence where that trochlear sits. Mm -hmm. um, not just statically, but also dynamically under the patella. And that is why we absolutely have to look globally. And it's really important that we don't just think about strength and isolation because it's got to be integrated into the whole system. So it's no good having someone be able to push a large amount on the leg press, but when they land from a jump on the netball court, they drop into a functional valgus because that's a habit that they've always done. It still means they're going to overload the lateral patellofemoral joint, even if they're really strong. So it's really absolutely key to be looking the whole chain. And there's more re emerging research looking at the trunk as well, actually, in that. The, that's an influence of the core, though that might be lighting a fire under <laughs> someone. But no, yeah. uh, and, and um, by the influence of the trunk, you mean trunk positioning as someone's moving through these dynamic movements, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And actually, on the course, I talk about uh, qualitative assessment of single stance. So some people will stand on one leg and the wobble, if you like, will all come from the foot. Some people it will all be arms, other people it will all be trunk. Yeah. And it's a nice, very practically applicable way of moving beyond unstable in single stance. Because that is so different, as I've just said. So if we're quantifying it a bit more, then it helps the patient understand, look, you know, actually, when you stand on one leg, you've got loads of trunk movement going on. So I'm actually going to give you a trunk strengthening exercise. Um, 
as part of your program. Now, if you've explained why and shown them, and look, our goal here is to make you be able to stand on one leg and be quiet on your top half. And I use the knee model and I sort of say, look, if we've got lots of movement going on up here, then it's translated down here. And this is your poor old trochlear trying to stay under the patella. The patients get that. Whereas if you just randomly give them a trunk exercise, they're going to go away and think, why is this relevant? Is he just cookie cutting something yeah. that he got from somewhere else? Yeah, and exactly. Throwing a core exercise. Now, I've seen that happen from patients and they bought me their exercise lists and they're like, yeah, he gave me core exercise or he gave me something for this and I've got a shoulder issue. How is this relevant? Yeah. Well, you play baseball, so it might be. Yes, you know. yeah. Um, but then one of the things that you mentioned there is obviously the influence of the hip movement or the ankle movement or what have you and that influence that it has then on the knee. Um, yeah on a dynamic valgus and the influence on the lateral uh, patellofemoral joint and how that will impact mm. there. How integral a dynamic kinetic chain exercises in your rehab programs? Because we spoke about the squat and I know that's one exercise and it's not um, reflective of a whole program. But yeah, it should be. It's very integral. And I like to also make sure that these more dynamic movements are incorporated that are meaningful to the patient. So if they have their pain, for example, on the stairs, to put them into step standing uh, makes sense to them. They're like, okay, I have my pain on the stairs, so the physio has given me this exercise. It's, I'm, I'm still making sure that it's either pain-free or, or minimal pain. Um, not because I'm worried about harming them, and I make that clear, but ultimately, if we're trying to do muscle activation or strength work, it doesn't make sense to do it in a painful environment. So step standing, stride standing, or a lunge with a tennis shadowing, these are all things that I cover on the course trying to, and I will start some of the sport specific stuff way before they're able to do their sport. So, um, you know, taking a runner, and maybe doing some running action work in slow motion on and off a chair, mm. because A, it's, they're gonna need that control with that movement action, but also it tells them non-verbally, this physio has listened to me, they hear what I want to aim for, they're taking it on board and they're integrating it into my rehab. Yeah, they're helping me move back to what I want. Yeah, they're so not just it's sending... not just another patient. Yeah, yeah, okay. Can you maybe break down, because this is something um, I've had a conversation with, with many interns and also other physio colleagues who are practicing elsewhere um in in different countries what exactly is the kinetic chain then we've touched on it we've spoken about it we've been speaking about it but what exactly is the kinetic chain well in this instance we if we start at the foot you know we need to be looking at very the various elements that uh pronation comprises of so pronation is normal but excessive pronation is what we're interested at with respect to patella from more pain so forefoot midfoot rear foot so that's the beginning part of the chain then we're looking at um the, uh, at what's happening in the knee with respect to rotation and obviously uh, how they're moving through flexion and extension then coming up to the hip have they got femoral well they will have femoral internal rotation and that's normal but is it excessive is it controlled then at the, at the pelvis particularly interested in the frontal plane whether they have an excessive uncontrolled contralateral drop then coming up to the trunk if they're unstable at the trunk, is it in the frontal plane? Are they rotating? So there are key components that are relevant to the patellofemoral joint. And you can anatomically argue the case. You know, yeah. we can't argue with anatomy. You can see why these are important. Yeah, fantastic, nice, I like that, nice breakdown. Uh, so you mentioned there the contralateral hip drop, um, moving, I suppose a little bit with that in a way. Do you ever see any other injuries that can occur alongside patellofemoral uh, pain? Yeah, definitely. So I, 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 um, I guess the most common one um, that fits with the contralateral pelvic drop is distal ITB pain. Yeah, that's so, what I was to... Yeah, so, and, this, and the understanding around that has changed actually. So it used to be thought it was a friction problem with movement of the distal ITB, and it's now known to be um, a problem with inflammation of a small pad of fat under the distal ITB that's richly innervated. So if we have contralateral pelvic drop, we have extra pressure down and com through compression of the ITB and through the ITB's 
patellar-slip uh, in that range, we would also likely get um, compression of the lateral patellofemoral joint. So they very often go hand in hand as well. Okay, nice. Anything else that happens around the knee at all? We can also then tip into fat pad problems, you know. So, and in that instance, we'd be likely to see a more asymmetrical fat pad problem. So again, fat pad problems vary a lot. But if you were getting a problem where you had compression, tightness down the lateral thigh, I'd ex and perhaps lateral tilt or translation of the patella, I'd be more expecting to see a laterally impinged fat pad. Okay, so if we've got someone with these extra injuries around it, where do you take the priority? Because obviously patella from oral pain is more of a flexion issue. Uh, fat pad issues are more of an extension issue. Yeah. And then with the ITB, that's going to be in your dynamic movements. If we look at uh, someone who's had an ACL op and they've had a meniscal repair, now, although they've had the ACL op because of that meniscal repair, that one takes precedence in the first few weeks. Then you move on to all your restrictions and whatnot yeah. with the ACL. How does that work with something like the telephone? Well, I think the first thing is to say that the ITB and the fat pad are inflammatory. So you cannot push through pain. You're just going to, if you're pushing through pain, you're just going to wind up pain on those sites. You're going to just wind up that inflammation. So there's no point in doing that. I think you quite rightly say the fat pad is much more a problem of extension. And we know from an MRI study that came out last year, actually, that it was a dynamic MRI study where they looked at the fat deformation through range in a, in a, when people moved in the scanner. It's very interesting. Well, I found it interesting. And, and every patient, every subject um, demonstrated the same thing, that the fat deformed um, massively between 30 degrees and zero or into hyperextension. There's less room for the fat and it has to d deform. So that is a tricky range for the fat pad. We know that beyond 50 degrees of knee flexion, the patellofemoral joint gets loaded a, a lot more and in a, a rapidly building way. Um, and as you say, we know that dynamic movements are harder for the ITB. So therefore, uh, in the early stages, we're looking at isometric work between 30 and 50 when they're acutely sore to get things firing up, get things working, whilst hopefully we get, it can also give some other strategies, perhaps taping, icing to break the inflammatory cycle, particularly with the fat pad. Nice. Um, nice thorough response there as well. So you often see people as uh, a secondary consultant, as someone who you know, patients are referred up to. So they've had this issue for quite some time. Mm. Uh, and we spoke about this previously, uh, just before the start of the podcast as well, people with the persistent pain, there are obviously going to be people that are very frustrated because they've had this issue for so long as well. And they've been going for physio and they've been trying X, Y, Z, whatever method, you know, even the latest fads, what have you. What is your approach with those sorts of people that have this ongoing problem for so long? And mm. how is it that you work with that patient to help one, bring them on side, and two, hopefully, eventually, help them to solve the problem. Yeah. Well, failed treatment, of course, is a beautiful driver for chronic pain. Um, and uh, it's really important to listen, first of all, really listen and ask about what they've had done, how long they did that for, to ascertain have they had the wrong treatment strategies or have they just not persisted for long enough or what's gone you know what's gone on here so listen to the patient is first is is key i'm keen to see whether it's still a mechanical problem so if we view patellofemoral pain as a mechanical problem very often after long duration they will start tipping into more neuropathic symptoms and I actually score that with my patients that I'm suspicious of with a LANS S score. So it's a very easy score to use. And it's looking at things like the presence of tingling, um, ability to have uh, light pressure, or is light pressure painful? So it's a series of questions that then gives you a score that you can ascertain if they're tipping to neuropathic pain. And if I have a patient with you know, strong neuropathic pain, and that's more of a feature than the mechanical pain, then I might look to manage that patient alongside a pain consultant because they might need some medical management as well, whether that be um, chili patches or lignocaine patches or, you know, or uh, a more uh, or oral medication. 
sometimes it, it needs to be done in tandem. So it's not one or the other, but it just helps settle that neuropathic side so that we can kind of almost get back to addressing the mechanics. Um, other things I'm really interested to look at, and in the light of Ben Smith's work, which was the first qualitative paper really exploring the experience of patellofemoral pain. And his work really showed how inaccurate the beliefs were about what was going to work. So the, the patients were reporting that rest, analgesics was going to, and maybe knee bracing was going to help them. And that actually exercise had often brought it on in the first place. So why on earth would you then choose an exercise treatment? Yeah. You know, so really trying to explore that with the patients. And unfortunately, quite a few of the patients have been told, you need to get stronger, so let's get you doing lots of squats and lunges. Now, do you need to get stronger? Yeah, I often agree with. But straight into lots of squats and lunges? No. Just winds the pain up, loses the patient's confidence. If anything, I say to the patients, let's get a line in the sand of what you can tolerate, particularly with these chronic, longer standing patients. Anything, anything is a line, you know, okay, can you walk around the block? Brilliant, right, so we know you can tolerate that. Now we have something to build from. Let's just build, build, build. And also looking at sleep, you know, often these patients were exercisers, and because their exercise has gone because of their pain, um, they then find they don't sleep as well. And then of course the layering uh, anxiety, the fact that it's a failed treatment, um, very often then over time their sleep is really disturbed and we know the effects of that. And the emerging literature on sleep is very compelling. So I'm asking all these patients about sleep and if that's a real issue and we're able to in any way, even if it's just get them in the gym doing an upper body program, then that's something I'd be looking to do. Okay. You mentioned there that a physio just throwing them in and throwing in a strength training program isn't necessarily the cure-all. Again, sounds a bit counterintuitive, right? Because what are we aiming to do? We're aiming to improve strength. Can you maybe expand on that a little mm. bit more as why the, the global concept of just getting strong is all you need to do might not yeah, be the cure-all. Yeah, it isn't. It isn't always. You know, if you have someone that comes in and they've been working out for several years aggressively in the gym, they're often really strong. There's no point in sending them doing yet more strength work. But what happens, you know, so you take someone that's strong but maybe has excessive pronation well, then actually maybe we need to look at, well, when they're doing their strength work in the gym, what shoes are they in? You know, do they need an orthotic, for example? Um, so it's about clinical reasoning. So yes, of course, strength is important, but it's not the right path for everyone. And even if it is, we've got to be really clever about what exercises we choose and use our understanding of biomechanics to say, this exercise is likely to be able to take them to fatigue, but not aggravate them. Whereas actually just doing lots of squats and lunges, yeah, it might take them to fatigue, but it's likely to really aggravate them, and then they're going to stop doing it. So it's about saying, do they need the strength work? If they do, what needs to get stronger? That's the other thing is, you know, if we want to keep the exercise program, the treatment program short, then we need to be quite precise about what we're trying to strengthen up. Otherwise, so rather than just glutes, you know, well, actually, it might just be that they've got problems with gluteus medius in the frontal plane. And that's their problem is that when they run, they get too much excessive contralateral pelvic drop. Or actually, yeah, it's uh, a runner that notes that at the end of their run, their knees are knocking. So they've got more femoral rotation at the end of the run because their rotators are fatigued. So let's really try and be specific so that we don't have loads of exercises and the, the exercises are, are really hitting the spot. Okay, great, fantastic. So we've mentioned a lot about exercises there. Are there any sort of adjuncts, so to speak, or anything outside of exercise that you mm. recommend for patients to do? Definitely, so I do use tape quite a lot, um, really just for the pain response, because if someone has less pain, they will move better, be able to do more exercise, engage better with it. And I try and choose taping techniques that are easy to replicate so the patients can do that themselves at home. So definitely um, that. 
proprioceptive work. So working uh, uh, around fine control so that then if they are walking on uneven ground, they're controlling their femoral rotation or pelvis or whatever it may be. So definitely looking at that. Looking at uh, stretching, we've mentioned. Um, if they've got um, edema in their uh, fat pad or they've got uh, a good going distal ITB problem, ice massage I also use. And as I mentioned before, orthotics as well. So you mentioned stretching as one of the mm. adjuncts that you use, right? Do you ever use foam rolling at all? Because I know that's something you've done some work into previously. Yeah, absolutely. And we've just had it accepted for publication. So that's great. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the foam rolling, uh, we looked at the architecture of the lateralis and how that changed with, we did two different trials, one with stretching and one with rolling. And what we want in the vastus lateralis um, ideally is um, a more vertical fibre angle. We don't want a bit la very lateral fibre angle because that's going to create a more lateralising force on the patella. And we found that people that started with a big angle, and generally those are the patients that have got hypertrophy VLs, like your cyclist with a big VL, they had, with both stretching and rolling, they had the biggest change in their architecture angle and they had a biggest reduction. So, for me, this fitted intuitively with what I would see clinically. So that person that comes in with big thighs, really tense, and sometimes I'll get people to stand up and just very slowly sway their weight side to side. Now that's a low level task, but if we're during that, they're really, really tense in their VL, then that VL is really <clears throat> tense and overactive. And then if it's hypertrophied, I would be thinking, okay, this is a really good person for stretching, rolling, massage. I think they're all having the same effect. They're decreasing tone, which in turn reduces the panation angle. Um, so, it, whereas if you take someone with a, a slender leg, I suspect you wouldn't, you wouldn't see the result. Right. So it kind of gives us a bit of an evidence base to perhaps what we knew or suspected anyway, but it's always so nice to have that science behind it. Yeah, something physical there to back it, a, a paper yeah. that you can lean back on. Now, you mentioned there that uh, the lateral force of the vastus lat. Is this something that, with patellofemoral pain that you see often if they have subluxations or patella dislocation or anything like that? Yeah, and it's gonna become more of an issue if they have a compromise to their stability from a, a congenital perspective. So if they have a shallow, um, entrance to their trochlea with perhaps a shallow lateral trochlea, then if they've got a big hypertrophied lateralis, that's a bad combination because you've got a patella that's going to easily, more easily sublux and, and a contractile situation encouraging that. Um, so yeah, we have patients that come through the door who present with pain, they're seeking help for pain, but in essence they have an instability problem that is driven by a shallow trochlea, or a lateralized tuberosity, or a high riding patella, patella ulcer. They won't know it's an instability problem. But if you're on your toes for it, and I talk about this during the course, then you will pick that up and it should then impact on how you manage them. How can we identify it if someone's got an instability in the patella then? What can we do? Yeah, so, it, well, for the, th the three different elements. So if we've got um, a shallow trochlea, you can t generally feel that when you're passively feeling the patella, it feels quite swimmy, to use a very non-medical word. So, you know, sloshes around, there's no feeling of a bony restraint underneath. And that will often be commented on an MRI. They'll often use the words shallow trochlea. Yeah. If they've got a high riding patella, we can look at that by putting our fingers on the patella, either ends, another finger on the tuberosity, and those distances between here and here should be the same. If we've got a high riding patella, they'll be like that. So we'll have much bigger distance here. And again, you can measure that accurately on MRI, but you don't, you know, you don't have to have it. You can get a snapshot of that in clinic. Um, so for example, if they've got a patella alter, high riding patella, once they're beyond 30 or 40 degrees of knee flexion, the patella probably has dropped down into the trochlea and is then stable. So their instability problem is between zero and 30, which is why so many of the patella ulcers are a risk factor for fat pad problems. So therefore, our dynamic stability and our rehab really needs to be offered up around that range. 
And then finally, tuberosity. You know, we want the, the tuberosity to ideally be central underneath the patella, but it can generally, if it's lateralized, then it's constantly just encouraging that patella laterally. We can't change that as physios, but if we spot that, and they've got pain under their lateral patellofemoral joint, maybe a slightly edematous fat pad, then what they absolutely cannot absorb into their shopping basket of risk factors is a femur that drops in. Otherwise, as I say to the patients, it's like wringing out a towel. You've got one going one way and one going the other. So if I spot that, I'm gonna say, that's a real pr priority for me, femoral rotation control. Okay. And then do you often see any other issues with someone that's had severe Oscar slatter then? Because that also is going to change that inception point. Uh, yeah, to I, I think I, it elevates it. And I don't think there is too much of a problem around that other than often they uh, have a legacy of tight and, and or hypertrophy quads, which, you know, I would be interested in. Obviously, if the Oscar Schlattis is active, then we need to manage that. The primary management of that is load management. Okay, interesting. And then you mentioned then that zero to 30 degrees for someone's got that patella ulta mm. is going to be the important aspect. Now, how are you addressing that? Is that going to be with VMO work or something like that? Or? So, well, I wouldn't even call it VMO work. It's, it's quads work that will often um, get the VMO working. Let's put it like that. We can't use the VMO in isolation. So quads work and control work. So it could be anything from a starting point of using some TheraBand, um, in, uh, in double stance, just working through that range. Then it might be in single stance. Can they uh, stand with isometrically with their knee at 30 degrees and then perhaps take that task and make it harder with head movement, eye movement, perturbation, that kind of thing. So lots of work around that. And then also making sure their movement uh, matches that. So a classic error is that people, when they go up the stairs, we'll put their foot on the stairs and then flick into hyperextension. So are they aware of that? Can they override it? You know, uh, and another little trick with that is I might put some tape vertically in their popliteal fossa when they're in knee flexion. And then if they go to snap into hyperextension, they feel it tug and it's just a little reminder. Nice. Uh, you mentioned the popliteal fossa earlier as well. Mm. And you mentioned that uh, sometimes there can be fluid buildup or what have you now. What what impact is that having on someone with a patella femoral pain uh, complaint? Yeah, so there's a number of things that can crop up here. So we can have an effusion that's also then pooling in the back of the knee and creating a Baker cyst. And my question then is, why have they got an effusion? Have we got to the bottom of that? They can have pain referred from the patella or the patella femoral joint to the popliteal fossa, and I don't know if anything's been written on this, but in my experience, it's people with subchondral bone edema that get that referral pattern. So perhaps the more degenerate knee, patellofemoral joint, can get pain into the popliteal fossa. We've also got more curious scenarios sometimes, like PCL rupture. So that can create some pain at the back of the knee, but it can also overload the patellofemoral joint as the tibia sags back. It oh, it creates extra load onto the patella. So I would say there, any patient that's had a blow to the front of the knee, just check the PCL. Because often what happens is they have the blow to the front of the knee, then they have patella femoral pain, and everyone says, well, you've had a blow to the front of the knee. That's why you, your kneecap's hurting. Yeah. But actually, the kneecap is hurting because it's overloaded from a missed PCL rupture. Okay, do you often see that uh, in clinic? I see that every year, definitely. Jeez. Yeah, oh, right. and also 50% of all people that fall heavily onto the front of the knee and don't have a fracture have pain at a year. So there's something about that really heavy blow. And again, I talk about this on the course, is looking out for that history of sudden onset of pain because they are ringers for quads inhibition because it really, that sudden onset really shuts the quads down. So then that person, that my priority list for their physical assessment and probably their treatment is looking at quads activation. Um, can I get in and get them to do some pain-free quads and start switching that back on and, and building back up their strength? Okay, nice. And you mentioned earlier as well, the use of orthotics and yeah. the reasoning behind the orthotics is for that tibial, femur, internal rotation aspects of it. And the 
impacts that that can have on someone with these dynamic movements more so. Yeah. Are you then providing any exercises for that or are you letting the orthotics do the job because you also mm. mentioned the shoes or what That's have you? a good question. Well, <clears throat> the first thing, let's reel that back. I think is who are, the, who are good candidates for orthotics? So I, will ask, I ask everyone about shoes. <laughs> Some of my patients think I'm obsessed about shoes because I end up having quite in-depth conversations. <laughs> but, you know, if your patient is no different in any different footwear or barefoot, slippers, flip-flops, work shoe, I would question whether they're going to benefit from an orthotic. But the patient has noticed, yeah, when I'm barefoot or, or in a, this shoe, I'm much better than that shoe. You know, that's a clue, isn't it? That, you know, the foot is important in this picture. So as basic as it sounds, ask about different footwear and being barefoot, how that impacts on things. So then we've got the scenario that if you've got um, medial collapse, if you like, from the femur, you know, so the femur's dropping in to internal rotation and adduction. If someone has quite a flexible foot, it will drive the foot down. But it's that sort of, is it top down or bottom up, the problem? So if I see that pattern, then I'm inclined to actually start work on the femoral control and then see what happens at the foot, because invariably you'll then find, ah, oh, now that the control is better higher up the chain, I don't think we need to do anything to the foot because this foot's now sitting happily because it's not been driven in. Mm. But there are definitely cases where people are uh, w worse in different footwear. You can sort everything out beautifully around the hip and pelvis, and yet they're still excessively pronate. And actually, a really floppy, a flexible foot is the best candidate for an orthotic. What I would say also, though, is if they have a tight calf, they won't. You need to address that first as well because. If you have a tight calf, the only way you can get over the foot is either with um, excessive pronation or an early heel rise. Well, excessive pronation drives the tibial rotation. The early heel rise forces you into more knee flexion in your gait cycle. So a tight calf is a problem for the patellofemoral joint. So again, I wouldn't be rushing to an orthotic there. I would be saying, let's address that calf length, give it six weeks, really focus on that. And then we make a decision as to whether we proceed to an orthotic. So I do refer people on for an orthotic, but only when I'm happy with the calf length, I'm happy at the hip and pelvis, and I feel that they've got a, a flexible foot um, that will adapt well. And also that they're a patient that's prepared to wear an orthotic. You know, some people just don't want to, so they're not a good candidate for it. Yeah, yeah for some people, they also don't have the hesitate to say but, but the patients for it as well because it takes them getting used to if yeah. you have an orthotic in there yeah. at first it's irritating your foot's not used to having this extra structure yeah there, yeah so. exactly for some people that's also the other thing i have many patients that come back that say yeah i was given an orthotic yeah two years ago or whatever but i took it out because it was hurting me or something like that yeah or it was just irritating or i don't want to use it again or I, the pain came back so i put it back in and the orthotic yeah. was more uncomfortable than yeah, the problem, exactly. so I just exactly. sacked it off. Yeah. Now, one of the other things that you that we've come back to a few times, I've asked you already about it, is that dynamic valgus. That, mm. uh, and it's something that over social media, it gets a lot of heat. <laughs> um, yeah, I love social media, I do. Uh, but it's something that often people try to say it doesn't matter if you try to address dynamic valgus because it's going to come back anyway so what's the point you know x study said that even if you address it in the runner the runner is still going to have some dynamic valgus as they go mm. what then is the point in us addressing it at all yeah well i think the literature is inconclusive actually on that and Anecdotally, I think, you know, you can, I personally think you can correct it to an extent. And, but the margins can be small, you know. So even if you only correct by uh, a few degrees, it might just be enough that the pressure is that bit less. We know that the lateral patellofemoral joint is at its peak contact pressure that you could possibly put through it at 60 degrees of knee flexion and 30 degrees of internal rotation. So if you put your foot on a stair, you have got to go through 60 degrees of knee flexion. So if you put your foot on the stair and you let your hip just flop in, you're going to go through that highest possible uh, um, force you can put on the lateral patellofemoral joint. 
So even if you don't co correct it completely, so they, mil may, they mil may still have dynamic valgus if you're measuring it, but it might be sufficiently improved that the joint stress is less and hence it, it tips the balance. Because let's face it, it won't be that in isolation. It will be that combined with their foot position or their endurance capabilities or the speed at which they move or the fact they move with a pack on or carrying shopping. You know, it's, it's never one thing in isolation in patellofemoral pain. And that's the problem often with the research. You're taking something artificially and looking at it. And of course, from a research perspective, that's neater. But I think that we don't have to do full corrections to see dramatic change. Oh, absolutely, I agree. And it's, it's what we spoke about before the podcast as well, with there's so many caveats of it depends or yeah. that particular person. And one of the other things with, with the research is it's such an isolated picture of everything else that's going on. So there's going to be hiccups or ways to show one particular outcome, depending on what the research is, how it assessed it Absolutely. and where that's going. Absolutely. And that's a real problem with meta-analysis, you know, in this field is that people are doing different things, using different outcome measures, different genders, age groups, you know, yeah. um, it's, it's very difficult to make it homogenous. Yeah, that's that. That's exactly it. I was reading a meta-analysis not uh, two nights ago, and uh, Mrs. is also a physio, so I was like, ah, have a look at this. This study measured it this way. This one did it that way. And the, you, you're comparing apples and pears yeah. here, and we're falling down the stairs. Like it, it, it's, it baffles me sometimes that people don't accept that the uh, heterogeneity of a study, of a meta-analysis, a systematic review, what have you, can also sometimes lead to a misrepresentation of the results, not an error, because no one, I hope, is purposely trying to send you up the duff, send you, you know, the wrong way down the street, but just the misrepresentation or misinterpretation of those results as well, would you say? I think yeah. that's right. I, I, I think people would like to be a bit purist and perhaps, you know, when you're first qualified, you're kind of hoping for this moment where you feel you've got it and you understand it all. And then actually, of course, the absolute reverse happens as you go along and you think, God, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. And that's OK, you know, and actually, you know, I've been <laughs> qualified for 26 years and I really love the fact that I'm learning constantly and changing my perspective and taking on new information and just tweaking and evolving the whole time. Um, and that, you know, no two patients are the same. So, you know, we, we ha of course we want to be evidence-based, but there's a long way to go yet. So the thing that actually wins hands down for me above everything is clinical reasoning. Listen to the patient's narrative. What are we seeing uh, with them objectively? Um, what is going to hit the spot for this patient? Um, you know, and there are many, many scenarios I could give you that could never be possibly covered in the literature. So I had a patient recently who was really distressed by the fact she couldn't do her exercise class anymore. She felt she was getting weaker. And then when we really explored it, as ridiculous as it sounds, one of the things she was missing the most was actually the music from that class. So I said, well, Okay, goal number one of your rehab plan, email the teacher, get the playlist, and then put that on when you're doing your physio exercises at home. Yeah. And, you know, that immediately enhanced her mood, which would have potentially changed her perception of her pain and what that meant. You're not going to find a research paper on that. So, you know, I'm a researcher. I, of course, value research, but we have to see it in the bigger context, definitely. Yeah, the application of that research is super important yeah. and the implications of it as well. Um, now, something you mentioned there is listening to that person's story. Mm. There's so much um, that I've learned being in practice and doing this podcast. No matter who it is I speak to, they're like, yeah, do you know what? we've got loads of clinical tests. But actually, after a while, you start figuring things out from the story more so than anything else. And that story gives you the indication of what's wrong, where it's going on, what times they're having it. And, and you can build a picture just from the story. And I think that's probably led to during this COVID period of the increase in telehealth as well and how it's aided there. And hopefully it's people's understanding of the story. How important is that 
for you, that communication aspect with your patient, not just in engaging and getting their story, but also the education aspect. Of, it's apps, yeah. it's king. Yeah. <laughs> it's number one. And I think it's also interesting to explore the concept of how we think. So um, if you're listening to the story and you're working that way, you're more inductive in how you're thinking. So you was thinking, Okay, so they've actually mentioned that when they get off their new low sofa, that's a problem, right? So actually, my physical examination, I'm going to look at sit to stand from a lower surface, say. And then, oh, actually, when I've watched them doing that, I noticed that their foot's dropping. So I might just do that barefoot and in a shoe and see what that does. And actually, oh, yeah, you know, I wonder if some tape might help that. So I'm going to go off and look at that. And... The thing with induction, inductive is it's interesting. It takes you all over the place, but it's more scary as, an, as a more junior clinician. Whereas for a more junior clinician, potentially hypothetical deductive reasoning is easier. I've got my hypothesis and I need to test it and I'm gonna have this or this or this as the yeah. outcome. So it's neater, it's easier to do, much easier to do, uh, you know, inductive, um, reasoning takes much more advanced clinical reasoning skills and um, it's more scary, if you like, because you don't know where it's going to go. But of course, you know, by, by my stage of my career, I find that really interesting. That's why I want to keep going to work. Keeps things fresh for you. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, th I think that's an interesting thing to be aware of for clinicians and for educators as well, that, that, that whole concept. But listening to the patient's narrative means that then the education I give them is hopefully relevant. I had an absolute classic last week. A patient said to me, you know, the last clinician I saw, um, they really educated me about running. They educated me about shoes and, and, and whether to run on inclines and how often and all of this. But do you know what the problem is? I've never run and I don't have any desire to run. And it's like, okay, so that person had had lots of education, but it was totally irrelevant to them. Yeah. So, you know, it's really important that the edge, so for example, if I have a, a, a new mum, that I might be saying, okay, well, let's talk through your day. Okay, so you're kneeling now all of a, all of a sudden. So let's look at, explore kneeling volume. Or you've changed your car, right, drive to the appointment and I'll come out to the car and have a look with you at your setup and see what's going on there. So making the education really relevant and then, making sure that around education as well, you're educating them why they're doing their exercises. You know, I ask all my second opinion patients, what was the gist of your previous physio? And I'm not looking for, oh, in a range gluteus medius. I'm looking for strength at the side of my pelvis or my legs spin in a bit, I'm trying to control that. I'm looking for that kind of sense. And uh, very often they can't give you that. So there's no buy-in to the exercises. They don't know why they're doing them. No, I, I find that really interesting and it, it's something I found, found myself doing with post-op patients a lot at the start where one of the big things is, hey, we're going to get you jumping so that we can get you back to running. And when they say, oh, I don't want to run for a, for a long time, I'd be there scratching my head like, <laughs> right, okay, that just kicks out a whole bunch of what my rehab plan yeah. was here. but. At the end of the day, if they don't want to run, they don't want to run. It, There's yeah. no point getting them Absolutely, doing that. Absolutely, yeah. You can prep them for whatever they need to do. Look, um, thank you very much. And there, there's a reason that we're here today, right? There, or there's a reason that you're here in Amsterdam, I should say. Um, you're working on a, a new course with ourselves. Yeah, very um, exciting. Can you maybe talk to us, give us a, a little um, synopsis on what it is in that course? Sure, sure. So it's all around patellofemoral pain. I do have a chapter on fat pad as well. And I also touch on patellofemoral instability. And it's very much aimed at the clinician. It's very evidence-based and a lot of the literature in it is from the last even couple of years. But ultimately, it's all about clinical applicability and being able to apply it without lots of fancy kit as well, which so many people don't have. Either in their clinics or at the patient's home. Um, so it's about strategies, key questions you can ask, key tests you can do, things to look out for, exercises, strength, length, movement control, taping techniques, um, things that are, yeah, I would hope for the really meaningful so that 
immediately after um, taking the course, you can pr evolve your practice. That's what it's all about. That's my passion. Yeah, taking it back into clinic on Monday absolutely, morning. Absolutely, yeah, really absolutely. You know, and as a clinician myself, I know what is meaningful and what isn't. Yeah, and I think that's also a very important thing as well, that you're not just a researcher, you're in clinic Monday to Friday. As yeah, well. you're, and you're there all with my patients. research has been driven by things I've seen in clinical practice and gone, oh, why is yeah. that happening? Like the crepitus work. So, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah, so I bring that to the table as well. Oh, that's something we didn't touch on, the crepitus stuff. Well, next time you're here, we'll have to, <laughs> next time, we'll have to get that one in. Got an excuse now. Um, but thank you very much. Are there any little bits or bobs that you'd like to leave the listeners with? Any little nuggets of wisdom, perhaps? Two or three things that... Um, don't be afraid to spend time listening and educating. I think physios like to feel like they're doing, moving, touching. Sometimes actually just spend your time listening and then educating. And don't give out too many exercises. Try and cap it at three. Fair. We'll cap that at two then. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much. Really it's appreciate a pleasure. you being Thanks here. Thanks for your time. Well, ladies and gents, thank you again for listening in. Really appreciate your time. Wherever you're listening to this, if you can, leave us a thumbs up, a like, subscribe, all that jazz. You know the drill. Have a good time and uh, maybe leave a comment down below. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye.